Constantinople in the Qur'an by Imran N. Hussein Chapter 5 The Qur'an has declared that an Ummah of Jesus السلام, will exist until the end of the world. When the Israelite people saw Jesus السلام, crucified before their very eyes and they were all convinced that he was dead, some of them who had accepted his virgin birth and believed in him as their long-awaited divinely promised Messiah must have wept in grief, while others who slandered his virgin mother and rejected his claim to be their Messiah must have rejoiced. What they saw before their very eyes confirmed to them beyond a shadow of a doubt that he could not have been the Messiah, since the Torah which was revealed to Moses, i.e. Nabi Musa salam, had declared that whoever died by hanging was the curse of the Lord God, Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 22 to 23. Since they saw Jesus crucified before their very eyes, it was now confirmed to them that he could not have been the Messiah. The Qur'an has recorded their sarcastic celebration of a crucifixion which had confirmed for them their rejection of Jesus. وَقَوْلِهِمْ إِنَّا قَتَلَّ الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَ بَنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍ مِّنْهِ مَا لَهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِلَّا اتِّبَاعَ الظَّنِّ وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا And how they boasted, Behold, we have slain the Messiah, Jesus the son of Mary, who claimed to be an apostle of God. However, they did not slay him, and neither did they crucify him, but it was made to appear that he was crucified. And verily, those who hold conflicting views thereon are indeed confused, having no real knowledge thereof, and following mere conjecture, for of a certainty they did not slay him. Surah An nisa chapter 4, verse 157. Allah Most High responded at that very moment by addressing Jesus alayhis salam, who they perceived to be dead, but who was still alive and conscious. Here is what he said to him. إِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى إِنِّي مُتَوَفِّيكَ وَرَافِعُكَ إِلَيَّ وَمُطَهِّرُكَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَجَعِلُ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوكَ فَوْقَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأَحْكُمُ بَيْنَكُمْ فِي مَا كُنْتُمْ فِيهِ تَخْتَلِفُونَ Lo, Allah said, O Jesus, verily I am going to take your soul, and I will raise you unto me, and cleanse you of the falsehoods and slanders of those who committed kufr against you and your mother. And I will then eventually cause those who follow you to be raised above those who committed kufr. When that happens, then your followers will remain in that position of dominance over their enemies until the day of resurrection. In the end, unto me you all must return, and I shall judge between you with regard to all on which you were wont to differ. Surah Ali Imran Chapter 3, verse 55. We know from the above that these words were spoken to Jesus alayhi salam before Allah Most High took his soul. Hence, he was still alive and conscious. But the Quran then declared that the divine plan was to make those present believe that he had died by crucifixion when in fact he would be saved from such a death, but no one would know of it. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ However, they did not kill him, and neither did they crucify him, but it was made to appear unto them that such had occurred. Surah An nisa chapter 4, verse 157 There is only one way that Allah Most High can take someone's soul and yet save him from death. What is that way? The Qur'an confirms that Allah can take a soul and then return it for an allotted period of time. Allahu yatawaffal anfusa hina mawtiha wallati lam tamut fi manamiha fayumsiku allati qada alayha almawt wa yursilu alukhra ila ajalim musamma inna fi thalika la ayatin liqawmi yatafakkaroon Allah Most High takes souls at the time of death but there are those whose souls are taken while they sleep who most certainly do not as a consequence die this is because Allah keeps those souls for whom death is ordained 
and returns the other souls for a prescribed period of time. In all this, behold, there are messages indeed for people who think. Surah Al-Zumar, chapter 39, verse 42. And so we now know what Allah Most High did in order to make it appear unto those present that Jesus alayhi salam died by crucifixion, i.e. that Allah took his soul and subsequently returned it. Many Muslims have been persuaded to believe that Allah Most High caused someone else to assume the appearance of Jesus and that innocent man who never claimed to be the Messiah was crucified for precisely that reason. This is not just nonsense but also dangerous nonsense and those who hold this belief which attributes an unjust act to Allah Most High must be warned to prepare to defend it on Judgment Day. The Qur'an then proceeded to inform Jesus that Allah Most High would raise him unto himself and hence that he, Jesus salam, would remain from that day onwards with Allah Most High. He was also told that Allah Most High would cleanse him of the falsehoods and slanders which had been hurled against him by that part of the Israelite people who rejected him and thus committed kufr. What followed these words spoken to Jesus at that critical moment is of absolutely supreme importance to our subject. Allah Most High conveyed to Jesus salam the news that he would raise those who follow him above, i.e. raise to a position of dominance over those who rejected him. And when that transpires, they would remain in that position of dominance until the end of the world. Those who follow Jesus salam must be recognized to belong to his ummah, regardless of whether or not they believe in a triune conception of God. And so we conclude with a clear declaration from the Qur'an that an ummah of Jesus salam will exist in the world until the last day. Since we have already recognized Rum in Surah al rum of the Qur'an to be the Ummah of Jesus salam, before the schism, it now remains for us to determine which side, i.e. Rum of the West or Rum in Constantinople, would remain his Ummah after the schism. Once that Ummah is recognized, we know that such Christians would eventually dominate the other Christians until the end of history. Chapter 6 The Qur'an and a city by the sea. This chapter attempts to answer the question, does the Qur'an recognize the existence of two kinds of Christians in Rum before the great schism of 1054, which would help us to recognize their differing religious profiles after the schism? We know that Rum of the West and Rum of the East are geographically different. Can the Qur'an help us to discern which of the two rooms is the Ummah of Jesus alayhi salam and which room will be blessed to receive divine help and to be victorious in the second victory that will occur after the great schism. The Qur'an declared that Muslims will celebrate Rum's victory. Since they celebrated the first victory which occurred before the Hijrah while Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was still in Mecca, they will have to celebrate Rum's second victory as well. And on that day of victory, the believers will rejoice. Surah Al-Rum, chapter 30, verse 4. The city by the sea. We now turn to a passage of the Qur'an, Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, 63 to 169, which refers to a city by the sea. Chapter 3 of this book introduced us to a city by the land and by the sea, which had three sides, and was easily identified as Constantinople. We then learnt of Allah's kindness to one part of Banu Israel, designated as Banu Ishaq, who were blessed to conquer the city without any fighting. And so now we know of a city by the sea, which is controlled by a part of Banu Israel. The Qur'an now takes us to a city by the sea, inhabited by a people who belonged to Banu Israel, we know that they were Israelites since they were obliged to obey the laws of the Sabbath in the Torah. The parallel between the city in the Hadith referred to above and this city, now described in the Qur'an, is thus quite clear. 
but the Qur'an went on to provide more evidence by which the city could be identified. The Qur'an described the community of Israelites living in the city by the sea who were Israelites and yet had dual religious profiles, while some of them strove to obey Allah and to thus faithfully observe the law of the Sabbath. Others, whose faith was skin deep, had no qualms in willfully violating the Sabbath and thus abandoning the sacred law. وَاسْأَلْهُمْ عَنِ الْقَرْيَةِ الَّتِي كَانَتْ حَادِرَةَ الْبَحْرِ إِذْ يَعْدُونَ فِي السَّبْتِ إِذْ تَأْتِيهِمْ حِيْتَانُهُمْ يَوْمَ سَبْتِهِمْ شُرَّعًا وَيَوْمَ لَا يَسْبِتُونَ لَا تَأْتِيهِمْ كَذَلِكَ نَبْلُوهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ Ask them, and hence remind them about the town which stood by the sea, how its people would profane the Sabbath whenever their fish came to them, breaking the water's surface on a day on which they ought to have kept Sabbath, because they would not come to them on other than Sabbath days. Thus did we try them by means of their own iniquitous doings. Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 163. The Torah prohibited work on the Sabbath day to the Israelite people. Hence, they were prohibited from fishing on that day. Allah tested them by causing the fish to appear visibly in their fishing waters only on the Sabbath day. On all other days, the fish would not so appear. They were thus tested to see whether they would remain faithful in observing the ban on fishing on the Sabbath day or whether they would fish and thus violate the Sabbath. وَإِذْ قَالَتْ أُمَّةٌ مِّنْهُمْ لِمَا تَعِذُونَ قَوْمًا إِلَّهُ مُهْلِكُهُمْ أَوْ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ عَذَابٍ شَدِيدًا قَالُوا مَعَذِرَةً إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ Some of them violated the law of the Sabbath and went fishing. Others who observed the law warned them about their violation of the law. Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 164. This verse above now informs us that those who remained faithful in observing the law came to the conclusion that those who were violating the law had passed the point of no return. And so they asked themselves, why do you bother to warn people whom Allah will either destroy or punish with great punishment because they would never change their sinful conduct? The response was to accept that the sinful ones would never change. However, they went on to explain that we do so in order to be free from blame before your Lord God and that these sinful people might become conscious of him. They were tested and while some remained faithful to Allah and observed the Sabbath, others failed the test by violating the Sabbath day. And so we are presented with a profile of a town by the sea with two kinds of Israelites. The first respected the law of the Sabbath and refrained from fishing on the Sabbath day while the second did not respect the law and went fishing in violation of the law. The verse above then described the pious first group, warning the sinful second group concerning their conduct. When it was pointed out to the pious that the sinful Sabbath breakers would not change their conduct and would eventually face divine punishment, the response of the pious was to accept the inevitability of divine punishment of the second group, but to also declare that we warned them in order to be free from blame before Allah Most High when they are punished. Hence, it was inevitable that a split between the two groups would eventually occur when divine punishment commences against the second group. And thereupon, when the sinful ones had forgotten all that they had been told to take to heart, we saved those who had tried to prevent the doing of evil and overwhelmed those who had been bent on evil doing with dreadful suffering for all their sinfulness. Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 165. They were punished to live like apes. Allah Most High waited until the sinful group had passed the point of no return in their sinfulness, at which time he saved those who were faithful to him while punishing those who had betrayed and abandoned him and his law and had thus become an essentially godless people. Then, when they disdainfully persisted in doing what they had been forbidden to do, we said unto them, 
be apes despised. Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 166. While that part of the population of the city by the sea, which remained faithful in observing the Sabbath, continued to remain believers, the other sinful group, whose faith was skin deep, were so punished by Allah in consequence of their persistent sinful conduct in violating the Sabbath that he said to them, be apes despised. The Quran made a second brief reference to the event of their violation of the Sabbath and their consequent punishment in the very first surah. You are well aware of those from among you who profaned the Sabbath, whereupon we said unto them, Be apes despised. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 65. Finally, the Quran returned to the subject for a third time when it warned in the passage below that it reserved the greatest punishment of all, greater even than the punishment given to those who mock the way of life that is based on truth and who mock the call to prayer for those who violated the Sabbath. The verse went on to reveal that those who violated the Sabbath would also violate the law of riba and that in doing so, they would worship the powers of evil. Allah punished them with the greatest punishment of all when he transformed them into apes and swine. Thus did it come to pass that human beings who should live the noble and exalted way of life ordained for human beings began to live instead, despicably so, as apes and swine. قُلْ هَلْ أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِشَرِّ مِنْ ذَلِكَ مَثُوبَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ مَنْ لَعْنَهُ اللَّهُ وَغَضِبَ عَلَيْهِ وَجَعَلَ مِنْهُمُ الْقِرَدَةَ وَالْخَنَازِيرَ وَعَبَدَ الطَّاغُوتِ أُولَئِكَ الشَّرٌ مَكَانًا وَأَضَلُّ عَنْ سَوَاءِ السَّبِيلِ Say, shall I tell you who, in the sight of Allah, deserves a yet worse retribution than these? They, whom Allah has rejected and whom he has condemned and whom he has turned into apes and swine because they worship the powers of evil. These are yet worse in station and farther astray from the right path than the mockers. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 60. The divine command, be apes despised, can be understood three ways. Firstly, it could mean that human beings were transformed into apes. We reject this possibility since a human being remains a human being from the time of creation until the day of judgment. The second possible explanation is that apes live a despicable way of life and when someone is punished to live like apes, he would then live as a consequence a way of life that is despicable. We reject this possibility as well since apes did not choose their way of life, rather they live a way of life ordained by fitra and fitra cannot be despicable. The third possible explanation, which is the correct explanation, is that human beings had been honored by Allah Most High to such an extent that the angels were ordered to prostrate before them in respect. When a human being departs from the way of life ordained for human beings and instead live a way of life akin to that of apes, such conduct is despicable. Is it possible for us to recognize such people whose conduct is like that of apes and hence despicable? Here is a ready means of making such recognition. The ape has no consciousness of shame attached to public nakedness or of any need for privacy in sexual relations. But from that day in heaven when Adam salam and his wife became conscious of their nakedness and hurried to cover themselves with leaves, the human being has always covered himself or herself in public and has always conducted sexual relations in private space. He always does so in consequence of a sense of shame attached to conduct that is otherwise. We now need to look for a community of people who emerged out of a city by the sea and who are supposed to observe the law of the Sabbath, who will live like apes while dispensing with clothing in public and who would consequently dispense with a need for private space as well when engaging in sexual relations. We can easily find them when they promote such campaigns as go topless. Eventually, they present themselves completely naked. We also look for those who are dressed 
and yet naked, since they also will eventually appear in public completely naked, like apes. Finally, we need to look for that civilization which is experiencing such a sexual revolution as would eventually witness public sex. We have one more comment on this subject before we proceed to identify the city by the sea. In several other instances in the Quran, when Allah Most High spoke in a similar way, He always refrained from describing a human being as other than a human being. For example, He described in the verse below a people who are like asses, but never said that they were asses. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاةَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا أَصْفَارًا بِئْسَ مَثَلُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهَدِ الْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ The parable of those who were graced with the burden of the Torah and thereafter failed to bear this burden is that of an ass that carries a load of books but cannot benefit from them. Calamitous is the parable of people who are bent on giving the lie to God's messages for God does not bestow his guidance upon such evil-doing folk. Surah Al-Jumu'ah, chapter 62, verse 5. Elsewhere in the Quran, Allah Most High describes people who are like cattle, but does not say that they are cattle. And most certainly, we have destined for hell many of the jinn and men who have hearts with which they fail to grasp the truth, and eyes with which they fail to see, and ears with which they fail to hear. They are like cattle, nay, they are even more misguided than that. It is they, they who are the truly heedless. Surah Al-A'raf Chapter 7 verse 179 Allah Most High even describes some people to be like a dog but does not say that they are dogs. Now had we so willed, we could indeed have exalted him by means of those messages, but he always clung to the earth and followed but his own desires. Thus, his parable is that of an excited dog. If you approach him threateningly, he will pant with his tongue lolling, and if you leave him alone, he will pant with his tongue lolling. Such is the parable of those who are bent on giving the lie to our messages. Tell them then this story so that they might take thought. We must, therefore, carefully recognize something startlingly different in the divine language when Allah Most High declared to human beings, be apes despised. He did not say, be like apes. Rather, he said, be apes. This not only represents the harshest divine language used against human beings, but allows us, his servants, to also use this language for those people who are condemned to live like apes, despised. The very same harsh language appears to have been used to describe an army from the Quraysh that will attack Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described that army as an army of kalb. وَذَلِكَ بَعْثُ kalb. Sahih al-Muslim Kalb can be a tribe by that name, but kalb can also mean a dog. It is possible that there will be no evidence of the existence of a tribe in Arabia by that name at the time of the advent of Imam al-Mahdi. Even if such a tribe were to be manufactured for the occasion, it is certain that the army which would attack the Imam would not be from that manufactured tribe. In addition, the advent of the Imam will be provoked by the death of one who would almost certainly be a Saudi king, after which the Saudi royal family will plunge into a state of grave disagreement concerning succession to the Saudi throne. Since the Saudi royal family would still occupy the Saudi throne, it follows that it will be their army which will attack Imam al-Mahdi. It is in that context that the second meaning of the word kalb would appropriately describe that army. Which city could it be? 
we have now finally arrived at the moment when we can ask the question, which city could this be? Which city fits this profile historically? From which city did a people and a civilization emerge who were essentially godless, since they willfully violated the divine law and who would eventually live like apes and be called apes? We need to look into all these matters when making a determination concerning the identity of the city by the sea mentioned in the Qur'an. وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَسَرِيعُ الْعِقَابِ وَإِنَّهُ لَغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ And lo, your Lord God made it known that most certainly he would rouse against them unto resurrection day those who would afflict them with cruel suffering. Verily your Lord God is swift in retribution, yet verily he is also much forgiving, a dispenser of grace. That part of the population of the city which consistently violated the Sabbath and was punished to eventually live like apes rather than as divinely honoured human beings was further punished by Allah Most High with punishment that was unique and hence facilitates our recognition of the identity of the city by the sea. Evil beings created by Allah Most High to be released into the world in the end time were now released in their midst and the Qur'an went on to reveal that they would remain in their midst as divine punishment which would continue until the last day. The only such beings whose lifespan continues until the last day are Dajjal, Gog and Magog and Dabbatul Ard. وَقَطَّعْنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُمَمَا مِنْهُمُ الصَّالِحُونَ وَمِنْهُمْ دُونَ ذَلِكَ وَبَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيِّئَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ And we dispersed them as separate communities all over the earth. Some of them were righteous and some of them less than that. And the latter we tried with blessings as well as with afflictions so that they might mend their ways. Surah Al-A'raf chapter 7 verse 168 This then was the moment when a divinely ordained separation within that community who lived in the city by the sea, began. فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ وَرِثُوا الْكِتَابَ يَأْخُذُونَ عَرَضَ هَذَا الْأَدَنَى وَيَقُولُونَ سَيُغْفَرُ لَنَا وَإِنْ يَأْتِهِمْ عَرَضٌ مِثْلُهُ يَأْخُذُوهُ أَلَمْ يُؤْخَذْ عَلَيْهِمْ مِيثَاقُ الْكِتَابِ أَنْ لَا يَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقَّ وَدَرَسُوا مَا فِيهِ وَالدَّارُ الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ and they have been succeeded by new generations who in spite of having inherited the divine writ clutch but at the fleeting good of this lower world and say we shall be forgiven the while they are ready if another such fleeting good should come their way to clutch at it and sin again have they not been solemnly pledged through the divine writ not to attribute unto God aught but what is true and have they not read again and again, all that is therein, since the life in the hereafter is the better of the two for all who are conscious of God. Will you not then use your reason? Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 169. The eventual result of the split was that succeeding generations of the sinful part of the population of the city by the sea eventually lost the world of the sacred and remained exclusively preoccupied with worldly life. Which city could it be? Which city fits this profile? Our answer is Constantinople. Hence, we recognize Rome of the West, which broke away from Constantinople, i.e. Rome of the East, in the Great Schism of 1054, to have given birth to an essentially godless modern Western civilization, which has abandoned the law of the Sabbath. As a consequence, we further recognize the presence of Gog and Magog in the room of the West. And we also recognize Dajjal as the mastermind who brought modern Western civilization into being. And we recognize Dabatul Ard as well, now emerging in this civilization. Finally, we recognize that modern Western civilization is taking its people to that way of life which is akin to that of apes. We may now recall the hadith about Banu Ishaq conquering a city without fighting. One side of the triangular city adjoined the land, 
while the other two sides were surrounded by the sea. We identified the city to be Constantinople. The Hadith informed us that the people of the city were eventually subjected to the presence of Dajjal in their midst. As a consequence of our recognition of the identity of the city by the sea, mentioned in the Qur'an to be Constantinople, and of the link between Dajjal and that city, we now turn to a proper study of the Great Schism, which broke Rum into two parts, Rum of the West, which abandoned the sacred law, and Rum of the East, which remained faithful in observing the sacred law. Chapter 7 The Qur'an, Rum of the West, and Rum of the East We have argued that when the Qur'an, Surah Al-Rum, chapter 30, verse 4, referred to victories of Rum, which would occur by Allah's command both before and after, Allah Most High was directing attention to an event which had not as yet occurred, and it was with reference to that event that the first victory would occur before and the second would occur after it. We identified that event, which eventually occurred to have been the great schism of Rum in 1054, which finally brought the curtain down in the feuds between West and East, and in consequence of which Rum of the West and Rum of the East finally separated from each other. The final clash which sealed the schism occurred when the western part of Rum, which was located in Western Europe, acted unilaterally to change the fundamental statement of belief which had been agreed upon by most Christians in Nicaea in 325, more than 700 years prior to 1054. The Nicene Creed, composed in part and adopted at the First Council of Nicaea in 325, and revised with additions by the First Council of Constantinople in 381, is a creed that summarizes the Orthodox faith of the Christian Church and is used in the liturgy of most Christian churches. The main accomplishment of the Council of Nicaea was that it settled for most Christians the vexed matter of the relationship between the Father and the Son in the Christian belief of a triune God. The Father, the Son, the Mother and the Holy Spirit. A room of the East, i.e. Constantinople, held on to the belief that the Father was the Supreme God, that the Son was not equal to the Supreme God, and hence that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father. A room of the West changed that fundamental statement agreed upon in Nicaea by adding to the Creed of Nicaea the declaration that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father as well as from the Son. They did so in an attempt to raise the Son to be a God equal with the Father. It was precisely this change which was made by Rum of the West to elevate the Son to a position equal with the Father that the Qur'an responded to in the following passage. وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بَنَ مَرْيَمَ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَهَيْنِ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ And lo, Allah will ask, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto men, worship me and my mother as gods beside Allah? Surah Al-Ma'idah Chapter 5, verse 116. Our readers should carefully note that Allah Most High did not question Jesus السلام, on any other such matter as Allah Most High begetting a son, or that Jesus is the begotten son of Allah. Rather, the question was directly connected to the great schism of 1054 and the effort of Rum of the West to raise the son to a position equal to the father. Allah Most High also questioned Jesus السلام, about the worship of his mother, and in this matter as well, Rum of the West parted from Rum of Constantinople when it elevated Mary to a position in which she became an object of worship. Orthodox Christians do not worship Mary. The Quran also responded to the false belief that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Son as well as the Father when it declared that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the command of Allah. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And they question you about the Ruh, i.e. the Ruh Al-Qudus or Holy Spirit. Say, the Ruh proceeds from Allah's command and you have been granted very little knowledge of this subject. Surah Al-Isra, chapter 7, verse 85. 
In all of the above, the Qur'an is severely critical of Rome of the West rather than Rome of the East. As a consequence, it must be recognized that the Qur'an does not treat all Christians and Jews the same way. Rather, it recognizes that some Christians and Jews are indeed believers while the rest are not. وَلَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ مِنْهُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَأَكْثَرُهُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ If only the people of the book, i.e. Jews and Christians, believed in Muhammad وسلم, as a prophet of the one God and in the Qur'an as his revealed word, it would have been beneficial for them. Amongst them, there are those who have faith, but most of them are perverted transgressors. Surah Ali Imran Chapter 3, verse 110. In consequence of the above, unambiguous declaration by Allah Most High, in which he has affirmed that amongst the Christians and Jews, i.e. the people of the book, there are those who have faith, while most of them are sinful in conduct, the system of meaning in the Qur'an on the subject must be one with which we can identify and demarcate the two groups, i.e., those who act in a manner consistent with the people who have faith and those whose conduct is otherwise. A people who have faith would not harbour feelings of hatred in their hearts for the believers in Allah Most High, nor would a people who have faith become friends and allies of those whose hearts are filled with such hatred. Hence, we can easily identify those amongst the Christians and Jews who are a people without faith. The Qur'an quite explicitly identifies the community of Jews to be a people whose hearts will display great hatred for Islam and Muslims. This was manifest in the lifetime of Nabi Muhammad وسلم, and has once again manifested itself in the modern age in which Jews have created the Zionist movement. لَتَجِدَنَّ أَشَدَّ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرَهْبَانًا وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ Strongest among men in enmity to the believers will you find the Jews and pagans. And nearest among them in love to the believers will you find those who publicly proclaim we are Christians because amongst them are priests who devote their lives to teaching and administering religious rites, and men who have embraced monasticism and have hence renounced the world, and they are not arrogant. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 82. We are Christians. Not only did the Qur'an identify in the above verse the community of Jews as the people of the book who are without faith, but it also went on to identify those amongst the people of the book who display love and affection for Muslims and hence display an important sign of faith. They are a people who proudly and defiantly declare of themselves that we are Christians. Christians who displayed love and affection for Islam and for Muslims did appear in early Islam when the Negus of Abyssinia, i.e. modern-day Ethiopia, rejected the request of Mecca to repatriate the Muslims who were slaves or semi-slaves who had fled from persecution and oppression in Mecca and had sought asylum in Abyssinia. Indeed, when the Negus died and the news of his death reached Nabi Muhammad وسلم, in Medina, he performed the funeral prayer for him in absentia, thus recognizing him as a Christian who had faith in Allah Most High, despite some of his Christian beliefs. There is absolutely no evidence from Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who conducted that funeral prayer that the Negus had renounced his belief in Jesus السلام, as the Son of God or that he had ceased to worship Jesus. Nor do we have any such evidence from the community of Christians of whom he was the leader. When there is no such evidence from these two primary sources, evidence from self-serving secondary sources is of no scholarly value. It is certain that such Christians will once again emerge in the historical process in a time frame that will match the contemporary emergence of Zionist Jews who display unprecedented hatred 
for Islam and Muslims. That hatred is most visible in their barbarous oppression of the innocent people of Gaza in the Holy Land. The verse of the Quran provides important signs by which such Christians who would be closest in love and affection for Muslims would be identified. They would be a Christian people who preserve the institution of priesthood and whose priests, from their patriarch down to the lowest priest, will demonstrate genuine love and affection for Islam and Muslims. This most certainly excludes the Vatican and the Roman Catholic faith the Anglican Church of England and all other Christian churches in Western Christianity. They would be a Christian people who preserve the institution of monasticism and whose monks will display love and affection for Islam and Muslims. This most certainly excludes Western Christianity, which has almost totally abandoned monasticism and the monastic way of life. They would be a Christian people in whose conduct there is no arrogance. This again excludes those Christians who brought modern Western civilization into being with an unprecedentedly arrogant agenda of imposing its unjust and oppressive rule over all of mankind at the point of a naked blood-stained sword. They would be a Christian people who would publicly and proudly identify themselves as Christians. This would exclude the secularized Christians of modern Western civilization whose primary identity is with their nation or state rather than with their religion. They cannot be a handful of scattered Christians who worship Allah as prescribed in the Quran and hence do not worship Jesus السلام, as a third person in a trinity and do not declare that Allah Most High had a son etc. Rather, they will have to be a community of Christians complete with their priests and monks, and hence easily identified. One would not have to search for them in some nook or cranny with a fine teeth comb. The Qur'an has also informed us in a very important passage in a surah which is named after Christians, i.e. Surah Al-Rum, that Rum, or the Byzantine Christian Empire, which was defeated by the Persians, would soon reverse the defeat and be victorious. غلبت الروم في أدنى الأرض وهم من بعد غلبهم سيغلبون في بدع سنين لله الأمر من قبل ومن بعد ويومئذ يفرح المؤمنون بنصر الله ينصر من يشاء وهو العزيز الرحيم The Byzantines have been defeated in lands which are close by yet notwithstanding their defeat within a few years they will be victorious for with Allah rests all power of decision, both previous and later. And on that day of victory will the believers celebrate in response to Allah's help, for he gives help to whomever he wills, since he alone is almighty, a dispenser of grace. Surah Al-Rum, chapter 30, verses 1 to 5. The passage from the Qur'an above went on to declare that on that day of Byzantine victory, Muslims would celebrate the Byzantine victory while recognizing that it was achieved in consequence of Allah's help. The implication of the above was that the Byzantine Christian belief in Jesus السلام, as the Son of God and their worship of Jesus as the third person in a triune God did not stand in the way of Muslims celebrating the Christian victory nor did it prevent Allah Most High from helping the Christians to achieve that victory. Hence, it was to Rum that the Qur'an had to be pointing when it declared that there would be Christians who would be closest in love and affection for Muslims. The Qur'an went on to exclude certain Christians from those who would be closest in love and affection for Muslims. It declared of such Christians and Jews as well that they will never be content until they succeed in getting Muslims to give up Islam and instead to follow their way of life. For never will the Jews be pleased with you, nor yet the Christians, unless you follow their own creed. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 120. 
This arrogant behaviour towards Muslims is found exclusively amongst the Rum of the West, i.e. Christians located in modern Western civilization. Do not take such Christians and Jews as your friends and allies. Finally, the Qur'an delivers the coup de grace against the Christians of the modern West, i.e. Rum of the West, when it prohibits Muslims from being friends and allies of those Christians who become friends and allies of the Jews in a Judeo-Christian alliance. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu la tattakhidhu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya ba'dhum awliya ba'dh wa man yatawallahum minkum fa innahu minhum inna Allah la yahdi al-qawm al-zalimin O you who have attained to faith do not take such Jews and Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other and whoever of you allies himself with them becomes verily one of them. Behold, Allah does not guide such evildoers. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 51. Regretfully, we have to explain, again and again and yet again, the application of proper methodology, which delivers the correct meaning of this all-important verse of the Qur'an. Those who adopted the incorrect methodology of studying a verse of the Qur'an in isolation or stand alone, have explained the verse to say that Jews and Christians are friends and allies of each other. Our first critical response to such an explanation is that Jews and Christians were never friends and allies, or patrons or protecting allies of each other, all through history until the modern age. They were most certainly not friends and allies of each other when the Qur'an was revealed. In fact, Jewish-Christian friendship and alliance was not cemented until the Second Vatican Council, 1962-1965, to exonerated the Jews for the crucifixion of Jesus, alayhi salam. Hence, any explanation of the verse that Christians and Jews are friends and allies or patrons or protecting allies of each other is manifestly false. Rather, Christians hated the Jews, whom they blamed for the crucifixion of Jesus salam, whom they worshipped as God. Jews, on the other hand, rejected the Christian blasphemy in their worship of Jesus as God, as well as in their declaration that God had a son and that God is three persons in one, etc. In explaining the verse in the way that they have, these translations and explanations have opened a way for critics to declare that the Qur'an has made a manifestly false statement. Secondly, even now after the mysterious emergence of a Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance, not all Christians and not all Jews are allies of each other. Indeed, most Jews initially opposed the Zionist movement which forged that Judeo-Christian alliance and to this day there are Jewish communities which reject the Judeo-Christian alliance. Many Jews were assassinated because of their opposition to the goal of the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance to create a Jewish state in the Holy Land. There are many Christians as well who reject this alliance with Jews. Most of them are to be found amongst the Orthodox Christians. Such Christians and such Jews are hardly likely to be impressed by a Qur'an which, according to this explanation of the verse, made a statement concerning them which is manifestly false. Thirdly, Allah himself declared that a Christian people would be closest in friendship and alliance with Muslims. This has already occurred in history and will recur at that time, as mentioned earlier in this section, when Jews will again display the greatest hatred for Muslims. The Qur'an will be contradicting itself if it were to prohibit friendship and alliance with a people who are closest in love and affection for Muslims. Rather, the verse of the Qur'an anticipates a mysterious reconciliation between one part of the Christian world and one part of the Jewish world, who will then forge a Judeo-Christian alliance between themselves. There can be no doubt that the Qur'an is here 
referring to the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance, which is located at the very heart of modern Western civilization. The Roman Catholic Church, led by the Vatican, played an extremely important role in forging that alliance. Muslims in Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Albania, etc. appear to be unaware of the fact that NATO is the military arm of that Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance. It is with these Christians and these Jews, and not with all Christians and not with all Jews, that the Qur'an has prohibited friendship and alliance. We began with the verse of the Qur'an, which described most Christians and Jews as sinful people. The sinful character of those who led Western Christianity is quite evident in the increasing legal acceptance of homosexuality by Western Christian nations. When a man can marry another man and get a legal marriage certificate in Western Christianity, i.e. room of the West, such Christians must be recognized as a people without faith. We conclude by reminding our critics that we do not have to engage in a theological search for such Christians who will be closest in love and affection for Muslims. Rather, we will recognize them when they display that love and affection. We also remind our critics that it is not we, Muslims, who will determine whether they are really Christians or not. Rather, the Qur'an declares that it is they who will proclaim themselves Christians. When that happens, this writer will recognize them as the Christians referred to in the verse, embrace them in a Muslim-Christian alliance, and move on in the historical process that will soon witness the conquest of Constantinople while leaving the adamant rejectionist critics behind. Chapter 8 Implications of Rum's Second Victory and the Conquest of Constantinople After the Great War As this book approaches its end, we remind the gentle reader that the Qur'an declared in Surah Rum that Christian Rum would twice be victorious, both before as well as after. We did not agree with those commentators of the Qur'an, whose view was that the second prophesied victory occurred at the Battle of Badr. Rather, we insisted that the Qur'an had declared that Rum would twice be victorious and the victory at Badr was not a victory for Rum. In addition, the interpretation of the second victory to have been the Muslim victory in the Battle of Badr did not in any way whatsoever explain the terms before and after used in the verse. In the previous chapter, we offered substantial evidence from the Qur'an which convincingly demonstrated that Rum of the East would fulfill the divine promise of a second victory. We also offered an interpretation of the use of the terms before and after to indicate that while Rum's first victory occurred before the Great Schism and hence before the parting of ways between Rum of the East and Rum of the West, the second victory would not come until some time after that parting of ways. Since the Qur'an provided accurate information with which we could know when Rum's first victory would occur, it is not possible that Allah Most High would leave the believers completely in the dark concerning the second victory. The implication is that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, must have made mention of the war which would witness Rum's second victory. In our book entitled The Qur'an, The Great War and the West, we provided substantial evidence from the Qur'an that Rum of the East, led by Orthodox Christian Russia, would be victorious in that great war against Rum of the West. When that second victory occurs, Muslims who celebrated Rum's first victory would again celebrate the second victory. They would therefore be on the right side of history, while those who are driven to madness in frustration and anger because of Rum's second victory would be exposed to be on the wrong side of history. If such people controlled power in the city of Constantinople, then the implications of Rum's second victory should be obvious for them. However, since they would be totally brainwashed, 
it becomes necessary for us to explain to them that which should be obvious to them and that indeed is one of the main purposes of this book. Implications of Rum's second victory It should not be difficult for our readers to anticipate that Rum's second victory, which Muslims will again celebrate as they did at the time of the first victory, would bring the two religious communities closer to each other, i.e. the worlds of Islam and the Orthodox Christian world, or Rum of the East. Lest there be doubts concerning the fate of those Christians and Jews who are recognized by Allah Most High as believers, but who do not belong to Rum of the East or to the Muslim world, it should be clear that all of mankind, including such Christians and Jews, would follow their hearts to join ranks with Orthodox Christians and with Muslims when they witness Rum's second victory. Those, on the other hand, whose hearts remain filled with hatred for Muslims as well as for Orthodox Christians, even after Rum's second victory in the Great War, will be left behind as history proceeds to a grand climax when the true Messiah will return to the world to dispose of the false Messiah. There would still remain one significant community of Muslims even after the Great War who would remain so blind and so brainwashed that they would continue to oppose Rum of the East and would do all that they can possibly do to prevent the two worlds of believers, i.e. Rum of the East and the world of Islam from coming closer to each other. They would be those Muslims who identify with the Ottoman Empire and who will still control power in Constantinople even after the Great War. The Ottoman Empire when the Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople in 1453 and the Ummah who accepted Jesus السلام, as the true Messiah lost their capital city, the Jews and their Western Christian allies then consistently struggled for the next 600 years to ensure that control over the city would always remain with those who can prevent an alliance of Muslims with Orthodox Christians. Their nightmare is that an end-time conquest of the city, as prophesied by Prophet Muhammad wasallam, would pave the way for precisely such an alliance. It should not be difficult for our readers to realize that when Constantinople is conquered, as prophesied by Prophet Muhammad wasallam, Muslims would return the cathedral of Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world, and that such a development would facilitate, if not seal, an end-time alliance between those who follow Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and those who follow Jesus, the true Messiah The additional nightmare is that the consequent loss of control over the Bosphorus from such an end-time conquest of Constantinople as prophesied by the Prophet would allow the Orthodox Christian Russian navy freedom of passage through the Bosphorus in times of war and such a development would have dire strategic implications for the Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance and for its golden calf, i.e. the Zionist state of Israel. Our readers should now realize that Constantinople can be used either to prevent a Muslim Orthodox Christian alliance or make such an alliance possible. Herein is located the tremendously important role that the city is destined to play in the end time. The implication of Rum's second victory, which Muslims will celebrate, is that it would bring out into the open the great gulf which separates the rightly guided Muslims from the misguided who continue to oppose Rum. It is at this time that a Muslim army prophesied by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would then have to liberate Constantinople in order to liberate the city from Muslims who obstinately persist in opposing Rum, an alliance of Muslims and Christians. Prophet Muhammad has prophesied, as only a true prophet could prophesy, that Dajjal would make his appearance in person as soon as the conquest of Constantinople takes place. Hence, the two religious communities who await the return of Jesus and who both oppose Dajjal i.e. Muslims and Christians who observe the Sabbath, 
would need to join forces to face a common enemy. The end-time conquest of Constantinople would take place for precisely that reason, i.e. to allow them to join forces together to face a common enemy. The Qur'an has warned that if they do not join forces to resist the kuffar, there would be great distress on earth as well as great corruption and destruction. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ إِلَّا تَفْعَلُوهُ تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ The disbelievers are allies of one another. Unless you, the believers, act likewise by building alliance among yourselves, oppression will reign on earth and great corruption. Surah Al-Anfal, chapter 8, verse 73. We plan to take up this subject again, insha'Allah, in our forthcoming book entitled From Jesus the True Messiah to Dajjal the False Messiah A Journey in Islamic Eschatology Constantinople remains to this day very dear to the hearts of one part of the Christian world i.e. the Eastern Orthodox Christian world while the other part of the Christian world i.e. Western Christianity which made a mysterious alliance with the Jews has consistently struggled to deny control over the city to the Orthodox Christians so long as they remained Orthodox Christians. This writer is of the view that the explanation for the Western Christian hostility to Orthodox Christians that is apparent in all matters concerning Constantinople can now be located in another alliance. Western Christians have made an alliance with Jews in the Judeo-Christian Zionist alliance. Orthodox Christians, on the other hand, are destined to make an alliance with Muslims. When the Ottoman army was poised to attack Constantinople, desperate Christian pleas for peace fell on deaf Ottoman ears. The noble Qur'an has ordered, وَإِنْ جَنَحُوا لِلسَّلْمِ فَجْنَحْ لَهَا وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ But if they incline to peace, incline to it as well and place your trust in Allah. Verily, He alone is all hearing, all knowing. Surah Al-Anfal, chapter 8, verse 61. The bogus Ottoman army did not care two peanuts for the noble Qur'an and its prohibition of waging war on those who sought peace. It was in these desperate circumstances that the Orthodox Christians turned to their Western Christian brethren for help to save the city. But Christianity of the West refused to extend any help that would save the city unless the Orthodox Christians renounced their faith and accept the Western version of the faith in which, eventually, a man could marry another man and get a legally valid marriage certificate. It was in these miserable circumstances that the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople took place in 1453. What occurred immediately after the conquest was even more miserable. The Ottoman Sultan defied the Qur'an, which had placed an obligation on Muslims to protect synagogues, monasteries, churches, and masajid. Surah Al-Hajj, chapter 22, verses 39 to 41. Instead of protecting Hagia Sophia, as he was obliged to do as a Muslim, he sinfully and shamefully and disgracefully converted it into a masjid. The conquest of Constantinople, prophesied by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, will occur for precisely this reason, to correct that great wrong which was disgracefully committed by the Ottoman Sultan in the name of Islam. When the Muslim army conquers Constantinople, insha'Allah, the very first thing that the Muslim commander would do would be to return Hagia Sophia to the Christian world. The analysis conducted in this book confirms that the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has not as yet taken place and that when it does take place it will liberate the city from the control of those Muslims who identify with the Ottoman Empire and who are so thoroughly brainwashed that despite books like this which explain the subject they yet cannot understand even the Qur'an. Allah Most High has commanded those who have faith in Him to wage a mighty jihad with the Qur'an against all those 
who reject the truth. فَلَا تُطِعِ الْكَافِرِينَ وَجَاهِدُهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا كَبِيرًا Do not follow the kuffar, rather wage a mighty jihad against them with this Qur'an. Surah Al-Furqan, chapter 25, verse 52. That is precisely what we have tried to do in this humble book. The Qur'an has provided information which allows us to recognize truth as it pertains to the subject of this book. And our primary purpose when writing on this subject was to turn to the Qur'an so that truth might be recognized and that falsehood might be exposed. In the process of accomplishing this important task, we hope we have brought clarity to the subject in such a way that the implications of the prophesied end-time conquest of Constantinople can now be understood in a definitive way. This book turned to the Qur'an to provide substantial evidence supporting an end-time alliance of Orthodox Christians and Muslims. It did so while explaining and interpreting several verses of the Qur'an and while returning to re-examine end-time prophecies concerning the city of Constantinople that had been buried by history with such sinister thoroughness that they were completely forgotten by all except the Orthodox Christian. Had this writer not chosen to pursue a lonely scholarly struggle these last 25 years in a hitherto unknown branch of knowledge called Islamic eschatology, there seems to be little doubt that a book like this would never have been written by any Islamic scholar at this time. And so, the troublesome problem to be addressed by the discerning reader is an explanation for the hitherto mysterious absence of eschatology as an independent branch of knowledge in Islamic scholarship. Chapter 9 And Jesus said, His name is Ahmed. There can be no better way to end this book than with a chapter devoted to describing the wondrous bond of love which binds Jesus السلام, with Muhammad Both the Christian whose heart is filled with hatred for Muslims as well as the Muslim whose heart is filled with hatred for Christians can benefit from reading this final chapter of Constantinople in the Qur'an. If the hearts of such Christians and Muslims do not change, if they do not get that hatred out of their hearts, they will both be left behind as history moves to a conclusion which will witness Christians becoming closest to Muslims in love and affection. Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 84. We have pointed out previously that the revealed scriptures sometimes express themselves in ways which cannot be understood unless interpreted and that only the Lord God himself can confirm whether or not an interpretation of his sacred word is valid or invalid. We have offered in this book our interpretation of several such verses of the blessed Qur'an but none can surpass the exquisite divine tenderness and wisdom on display in the subject to which we now turn. Allah Most High has addressed Prophet Muhammad in the Qur'an in several different ways. For example, he has addressed him as his abd, i.e. servant or slave, rasul, i.e. messenger, nabi, i.e. prophet, etc. But on four occasions in the Qur'an, Allah Most High has addressed the Prophet by the name Muhammad, thus recognizing that his proper name is indeed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is no more than just a messenger of Allah Most High. Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 144. ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has no son. Surah Al-Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 40. والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وآمنوا بما نزل على محمد وهو الحق من ربهم كفر عنهم سيئاتهم وأصلح بالهم. Those who have attained to faith and do righteous deeds and have come to believe in what has been bestowed from on high on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for it is the truth from their sustainer, shall attain to Allah's grace. He will efface their past bad deeds and will set their hearts at rest. Surah Muhammad chapter 47 verse 2 Muhammadur Rasulullah 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. Surah Al-Fatih, chapter 48, verse 29. The above four verses of the Qur'an inform us very clearly and with no ambiguity whatsoever that the name of the Prophet, i.e. to whom the Qur'an was revealed, as confirmed by Allah Most High Himself, is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is therefore astonishing to say the least that Jesus alayhi salam should declare his name to be other than Muhammad. Here is the astonishing verse of the Qur'an in which Jesus alayhi salam makes that declaration. وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بَنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاتِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ فلما جاءهم بالبينات قالوا هذا سحر مبين. And Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O Israelite people, behold, I am the messenger of Allah sent unto you, sent to confirm the truth of whatever there still remains of the Torah, and to give you the glad tiding of a messenger of Allah who shall come after me, whose name shall be Ahmed. Surah Al Saf, chapter 61, verse 6. The correct explanation of the above is that when Jesus gave the name Ahmed, he was referring to Muhammad. The question which now remains to be answered is why did Jesus give him a name other than the name confirmed by Allah Most High? Why Ahmed and why not Muhammad? Our interpretation which answers this question is that intense love for Prophet Muhammad وسلم, caused Jesus السلام, to give him a special name which was other than his formal name. When people have great love for each other, they always seek a special name through which they can give expression to that love. This is quite common when parents express their love for their children. Hence we are confident that when Jesus السلام, returns to this world, whenever he refers to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he would always use the special name of love, i.e. Ahmed, rather than the formal name of Muhammad. We may also remind our gentle readers that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, prophesied, as only a true prophet of the Lord God can prophesy, that Jesus السلام, would eventually die, as all before him died, and that he would then be buried next to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the Arabian city of Yathrib, now known as Medina. وَعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمَ يُدْفَنُ مَعَهُ جَامِعَ التِّرْمِذِي It should not now be difficult for the discerning reader to recognize the divine message that has come from the above. If this is the extent of love which binds Jesus السلام, with Muhammad وسلم, then it follows that the followers of both Jesus السلام, and Muhammad وسلم, are destined to draw closer to each other in friendship, in love and eventually in an alliance with which to confront the enemies of both of them.